Hello guys, we've come to our point in the book of Amos where we must begin to talk about lament. Remember, this is Northern Kingdom Israel during the era of Jeroboam II's reign. And we've talked extensively about the nature of the injustice. In chapter five, we get some fresh reminders again as Amos is continuously putting before his people the nature of their sins. Confronting injustice is a spiritual act, but responding to that confrontation is part of our spiritual formation as well. What is this raising of voice that Amos is doing? This is in fact an invitation into a funeral song. One way to mourn something or somebody is song. And this we're about to listen to is a funeral song, a prophetic dirge inviting Israel to mourn over the injustice as an act of renewal towards God. I'm in a bubble. All right, guys, you ready? This is Amos chapter 5, verses 1 through 17. Hear this word that I take up over you in lamentation, O house of Israel. Fallen no more to rise is the virgin Israel, forsaken on her land, with none to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that went out a thousand shall have a hundred left, and that which went out a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, and do not enter into Gilgal, or cross over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into exile, and Bethel shall become nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph, and it devour with none to quench it for Bethel. O oh, you who turn justice into wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. Let me read from Easton's Bible Dictionary. This is absinthe. It is noted for its intense bitterness. It is a type of bitterness, affliction, remorse, and punitive suffering. In Amos 6.12, this Hebrew word is rendered hemlock. Guys, this is some nasty stuff. He who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the surface of the earth, the Lord is his name, who makes destruction flash forth against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. They hate him who reproves in the gate and they abhor him who speaks in truth. And there's this bit about an old hymn with stars and stuff. What's that all about? This is Pleiades and Orion. Pleiades, the seven sisters, which is a star cluster, is being kind of pointed at by Orion, known as the wild hunter. All right, see if you guys can find these in the night sky the next time you're out late. Commentators have noted that this is an old hymn and it has some rhetorical effect in the middle of this funeral dirge. You know, it's, it's sandwiched between these accusations of Therefore, because you trample on the poor and you exact taxes of grain from him of injustice and then there's this old standby hymn that they would have known. So maybe I can mimic some of the rhetorical effect by saying something like this. or singing something like this. Pardon me for a moment. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. But can you also hear the cry of the unborn and the immigrant and the poor and the vulnerable? You have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins you who afflict the righteous who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate therefore he who is prudent will keep silent in such a time for it is an evil time seek good and not evil that you may live and so the lord the god of hosts will be with you as you have said hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate it may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, 
will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Therefore thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the Lord, in all the squares there shall be wailing, and in all the streets they shall say, Alas, alas, they shall call the farmers to mourning and to wailing, those who are skilled in lamentation, and all the vineyards there shall be wailing, for I will pass through your midst, says the Lord. The speech verb, I take up, or I, I lift, uh, I, I lift a lament, I raise a lament. This is actually a different kind of speech act, suggesting that Amos is, is getting quite loud about this, wailing, inviting his people into lament. So what is predicted here, we, you know, we've, talked about, we've talked a little bit about how prophecy, uh, not only does it have an aspect of reminding God's people of where they've been, and an aspect of confronting the people with where they're at, it does have this future element to it as well. It seems like Amos is reaching into the not too far future where Israel is destroyed by Assyria in 722 BC. There is coming judgment. We've talked about the covenantal framework of this text of Israel's relationship with God. And we know that one of the things that happens when, when the covenant people tarnish the relationship with God after him patiently reminding them generation after generation to repent, eventually the covenant judgment comes. But does that mean, just because covenant judgment is coming, does that mean that there is no opportunity to respond to it? That there's no opportunity to renew relationship with God? There's two things I want to note. That the covenant judgment in and of itself suggests an ongoing relationship with God and thus is a source of hope. And secondly, even in this lament, this painful song, we have a sense of direction to aim towards God. Notice how many times you hear the word, seek the Lord. In verse 4, seek me and live, a personal invitation from God. In verse 6, rephrased, Amos invites them, seek the Lord and live. In verse 14, seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord Almighty will be with you. So guys, three times we have this verb to seek. In Hebrew, it is derash. We are to seek God, what are we to do in this scenario where we're hearing and being exposed to the injustice? We are to lament. And this lament, this funeral song, is an invitation to seek God himself. We look at the funeral song and how it reminds the people over and over again. Amos will not relent in reminding the people of the injustices they perpetuate. I think there's a lesson to be learned there. But guys, is it, is it simply to bash Israel? No. This prophetic indictment, this funeral dirge, is in fact an opportunity to restore their relationship with God. I'm going to read from this wonderful commentary from Douglas Stewart on the book of Amos, the Word Biblical Commentary series, kind of summarizing how this could apply to us today. Upright, fair behavior in society is no less a responsibility of the believer and no less necessary to orthodox faith and worship now than it should have been in Amos' day. So guys, if, if God is inviting Israel to examine their societal brokennesses, I think we need to take a hard look at our own. We've mentioned some in this study, in this session, and here today I want to invite us into a funeral dirge of our own. I want to put in front of us some injustices that reign in our land. And a fair warning, these injustices stretch across the spectrum of belief in America because injustice in a broken world is a bipartisan value. Just as Amos intended to trample on the toes of those who perpetuated injustice, I don't see any way around it. Sing a song of lament, a funeral song for the broken society, 
around us. In his book, Is Justice Possible?, J. Paul Nyquist points out some unjust laws in the land of notable account is Roe v. Wade. Let me quote him from his book on page 49. Roe v. Wade is an unjust law. It is contrary to God's word and denies the sanctity of human life. Unfortunately, to our shame, it has remained in force for more than four decades in the bloody shadow of 56 million abortions. Let me add that this is an affront to God and a betrayal of the theology of the image of God that we are made and cherished in God's image. Another injustice that exists in our country, he points out on page 51, immigration deportation laws are unjust. He says, immigrants matter to God. How we treat immigrants matters to God. Deportation laws that rip children from their parents are not just. Guys, this is an injustice that's happening today as well. There's an injustice called the school to prison pipeline. Let me read from an advocacy organization's website. They say, historical inequities in the education system, segregated education, concentrated poverty, and longstanding stereotypes influence how school officials and law enforcement both label children and treat students who present challenging behavior. Studies show that students of color receive harsher punishments for engaging in the same conduct as white students. Racially isolated schools that primarily educate students of color are more likely to be among the nation's dropout factories and also those that utilize the harshest, most exclusionary means of discipline. This funneling of students out of school and into the streets and the juvenile correction system perpetuates a cycle known as the school-to-prison pipeline, depriving children and youth of meaningful opportunities for education, future employment, and participation in our democracy. Take a look at vagrancy laws. These seem like they've been outdated, but let me just read a real quick thing here. If you guys want to pause, you're more than welcome to read the whole article here. But they served as a ubiquitous tool for maintaining hierarchy and social order in American society. Basically, these laws pretty much made being homeless legal. That can't be happening today, can it? Let's take a look at this resource. Let's read some statistics here. 76% of cities prohibit begging in particular public places. 24 impose city-wide bans on begging in public. Loafing, there's laws against loafing. Huh? There's laws against sleeping in vehicles. Guys, if you needed a place to sleep, 43% of cities wouldn't let you sleep in your own car. And guys, this one really bothered me. I know it's only 9%, but 9% of cities prohibit sharing food with homeless people. So let's take a look at one city you guys might be familiar with, the home of Disney, right? Orlando, Florida. 34% of homeless people in the Orlando area are without shelter beds, yet the city restricts or prohibits camping, sleeping, begging, and food sharing. The criminalization of homelessness is an injustice in our society today. So guys, the nature of the injustices in Amos's day, taking advantage of the poor, taking advantage of the vulnerable, they're just different expressions of the same thing that's happening today in our justice system, in our healthcare system, in our immigration policies. There are laws as unjust as the laws that were rampant in Israel. We have to face that. As a Christian, I can't leave us there simply acknowledging the brokenness. And nor does Amos. You see, acknowledging the brokenness and lamenting in this funeral is the opportunity we're looking for to renew our relationship with God. Do you guys remember in the book of Jonah, the Ninevites, who when confronted with their own sin, what, what did they do? They lamented. This sackcloth and ashes idea, it, it, it's remaining in a state of mourning over the brokenness, the affront to their relationship with the living God. These Ninevites hold as an ironic counterpart a, a satirical mirror to Israel as their responsiveness to God is remarkable.
Remember Jonah said that the Ninevites would be overturned in 40 days, right? That there would be something that happened for 40 days. For Jonah to stick around and to see that God wasn't going to take the city and destroy it, it's likely that he waited at least 40 days, right? So the Ninevites fasting in sackcloth, in ashes, mourning, lamenting, to the prophetic indictment, it seems they did it for a good long while. If we're invited into a season of lament, we don't simply lament for the time that we choose, but we lament until God changed the season. I think that's what he did in Nineveh, and that's what he was inviting to happen in Jeroboam the second's Israel. We're going to unpack the rest of the funeral dirge in our next session. But for the moment, I want to invite you, as Amos does, into the funeral song. And we who believe in a crucified Lord believe that good things can happen through a funeral. Right? Isn't this the cruciform nature of our faith that we pick up our cross daily? Guys, the funeral as dark and as frightening as Good Friday was, Easter Sunday was coming. We are a people of hope. And our hope is found in a crucified Lord. This means to fully embrace lament, to fully sing the funeral song about the crumbling injustices of our society. Well, that is the pathway towards life. To die is to gain. So, guys, I got to be honest. I, I'm learning what lament is. I don't fully understand what it means or how to do it or how to use it as a spiritual discipline. But I am inviting you to be broken. I think that's this key part of lament. To weep, to wail to be sad about, to feel the weight of the injustices that reign in our land. Whether or not we feel like we do them, that we are the architects of it, that we are the the ones who carry out these injustices, these injustices are a part of our societal fabric and in a way, we're complicit with it. So let us be broken. Let us be broken. Let us sing the funeral song. And in this brokenness and in this singing, like the Ninevites, may we seek and may we find God and his restorative, marvelous, beautiful, transformative hope. There is hope in the funeral, my Christian brothers and sisters. Let us find it together. So guys, let us hear the funeral song of Amos. We who follow a crucified Lord should know that good things can happen at a funeral. Douglas Stewart again. God invited a reaction, the choice between himself and mere cultic activity. It is not the process of religion, but the person of God that Israel must seek. Darash. Who are we after? What are we seeking? Are we seeking a religion that enables us to continue going out about our lives as normal, perpetuating societal injustice? Or are we looking for an encounter, a relationship with the living God that will reform from within everything about us and expand to the world around us? We want God. So guys, the funeral dirge, the funeral song, this invitation to wailing and to mourning over the brokenness of the world. This is a place where we can seek and find a living God. Do you want to seek God? Do we want to seek God as we acknowledge our brokenness?